You've heard a little bit about uh, Mr. Ivan Zinger, uh, prison um, uh, ombudsman. Um, I'm going to skip over, but a little bit uh, for the people that may have not have been here earlier. He's a lawyer with a, a BA in psychology, graduated in 1992. What often interests me is how people got to their jobs. Um, he went on to complete a PhD in 1999. Um, the road he traveled from 92 to his appointment as the OCI uh, is actually quite interesting. In 1996, he joined the Public Service of Canada in the midst of the fallout from, as they call it, certain events um, in 1994 at the Prison for Women. Incoming CSC Commissioner Ole Ingstrup was then asked to sort of clean up the problem, and he turned to Mr. Zinger, who was tasked with reprogramming corrections managers. It's a fun job. Uh, in 1998, Mr. Zinger was named manager of CSC's first human rights division, a division he argued needed to exist within CSC. Uh, the following year, in 1999, he earned his PhD. The topic was the psychological effects on inmates from solitary confinement. How many years did it take? Uh, Mr. Zinger joined the office of the correctional investigator in 2004 under former OCI Howard Sapers. Um, he uh, was the Director of Policy and Senior Counsel and ultimately in 2005 was named its Executive Director and General Counsel. And together, the dynamic duo, the two assisted by dedicated team members, breathe life and purpose into the office because there wasn't a lot of life in the office at that time. And many important reports have flowed from <coughs> its work. And he showed on the screen the different reports that had been done. In 2008, there was the Ashley Smith report. In 2012, a report entitled Spirit Matters, Aboriginal People and the, Correctional, uh, the Corrections Conditional Release Act. In November, Mr. Sapers left the OCI and Mr. Zinger became the acting correctional investigator. And then in January of 2018, thereabouts, Mr. Zinger, Zinger was appointed the correctional investigator. Um, I then have, as well, um, to his um, right, um, Dr. L. Jane McMillan. Um, she is a legal uh, anthropologist. Uh, she is the former Canadian Research Chair for Indigenous Peoples and Sustainable Communities, 2006 to 2016, and the current Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Anthropology at St. Francis Xavier University. Um, cultural and legal anthropologist with a specialization in Indigenous justice. Jane has worked with Mi'kmaq communities for over 20 years. She's been involved in policy analysis and advocacy in support of Aboriginal rights and self-determination, including community-based justice that is aligned with Indigenous beliefs. Um, like Ivan, her path is, uh, to, to this position is very interesting. As Donald Marshall's partner, she was an eel fisher and one of the original uh, defendants in the SEC uh, Marshall decision, 1999. I say eel fisher, I think she's still fishing eels. She's still fishing slippery things. Slippery. Um, very slippery. <laughs> um, president of the Canadian Law and Society uh, Association and coordinator of the Law and Indigeneity Collaborative Research Network of the American Law and Society Association member of the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia Canadian, uh, Canada Tripartite Forum uh, Justice Committee, and her most recent publication is Truth and Conviction, Donald Marshall Jr. and the Mi'kmaq Quest for Justice, a long one, UBC Press 2018, available this November. Um, Jane was also a uh, PI, and I always get this wrong, PI is? Uh, principal investigator, not a private investigator. <laughs> I, I kind of like. Although Anique thought I was a private investigator, I which said, is you sort of anthropological. It. Right, I said, mad, mad dog, you went that far. <laughs> um, on an uh, evaluation of the implementation and efficacy of the Marshall Inquiry recommendations in Nova Scotia, 2011 to 2016, very important when you consider where we stand today and what still needs to be addressed. Um, this collaborative community-initiated research examined the outcomes transformations and disappointments stemming from the Royal Commission on the Donald Marshall Jr. prosecution um, with its attending Marshall recommendations. 16 community forums were held in Mi'kmaq communities across Nova Scotia. It's a lot of work. Focus groups were held with law students, Nova Scotia Legal Aid, the Race Equity Committee of the Nova Scotia Barristers Society, Indigenous members of the RCMP, and the Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network. Again, Paula Marshall's organization. 
Um, interviews were conducted with the Nova Scotia Office of the Police Complaints Commissioner, the Office of the Ombudsman, the Aboriginal Policy Analyst H Division, and with a member of the Commissioner's Aboriginal Advisory Board for the uh, RCMP. So what happened, outcomes of the policy uh, informing work, uh, consist of three volume research report for the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia Canada Tripartite Forum, a high level justice symposium, support for the opening of an Indigenous People's Court in well, well, Cook. Thank you. Um, and a number of scholarly uh, publications. Um, we have a, we were talking about powerhouses um, in the opening keynote. Uh, panel. We have uh, a powerhouse. Pam Glode de Roche is the executive director of the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center in Halifax, where she's worked for almost 25 years. Uh, 1994, uh, Ms. Glode de Roche was a person in need. Well, this is the interesting part. She was a person in need no different than anybody else that comes up to the steps of the Friendship Center, and the center's door opened. And the years passed, and she was healed by her community, and they helped her grow and flourish. Um, I actually asked her what she meant by her community when she kept saying, well, my community helped me. And her answer was, the Urban Indigenous Friendship Center movement just picked her up. Um, and as, you know, at one point I said, well, then you were forged from all of this. I mean, you became um, their fiercest advocate, their fiercest warrior because uh, he never left, and she never left. Um, empowered by her culture, its teachings, and the knowledge of what it can do, Ms. Glode de Roche became the center's executive director and set to work in addition to working on the issues that plague urban indigenous people, such as homelessness and hunger and addiction and more. Pam sits on five boards. Uh, she sits on the board of the National Association of Friendship Centers, the NAFC. She spends considerable time in Ottawa, involved in consultation and advocating on behalf of Indigenous people. And in her role as executive director, Pam has spearheaded, um, as the executive director of the Friendship Center, she has spearheaded the development of a new Friendship Center <coughs> idea, a building that she hopes to see built on land in <coughs> 70,000 square feet for healing and programming and teaching. And she has gotten further than any of her opponents could have guessed. Um, asked what her vision was for the building's appearance, Pam's answer was, I want to make sure that when you look at it, people get a real understanding of the territory that we're on. The Mi'kmaq are still here and they're not going away. Which I thought was great. Um, so these uh, individuals, the way I want to sort of look at it is, I've got some, you know, questions that I wanted to ask, um, but really it's a conversation. And I've got different slides that um, Ivan Zinger has prepared. A good government person always has a PowerPoint. <laughs> and a Blackberry. And a, that's true. Um, so the, the, what's very interesting um, I talked about this September 5 release of this mandate letter um, from Ralph Goodale, um, which is very, very interesting. Um, and interestingly, Anne Kelly, the new commissioner, responded, as I said, equally uh, publicly. Um, and Anne Kelly has been around for quite a long time, but ultimately here she is in charge and he is welcoming, welcoming her with this uh, mandate. Um, and importantly, he says, I acknowledge that some of these initiatives that I'm looking to propose may require new policy authorities and or funding. It's a key issue, which we can work on together. I also want to applaud the progress already made in certain key areas such as reducing the use of administrative, administrative I mean, segregation. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I sat through a, a previous panel uh, that ended up having no Indigenous people speaking on it, and I'm now sitting, and there are two Indigenous okay. people whom I would really like to hear from. Could we move on to the panelists? Yes, I just wanted to... not start, with yeah. all due respect to Mr. Zinger, not start with Mr. Zinger. Yeah, that's great. I just wanted to put this out and... Please move on to the panelists. Okay. 
So in terms of, I think you've all had an opportunity to review um, the commissioner's mandate letter, but first what I would like you maybe each to do, and I will start with um, maybe uh, Jane McMillan, I'll ask you first. Um, maybe it would help um, us to sort of contextualize your answers to different things and your comments if you could just give us a, an overview of where you're coming from, your perspective on changes uh, with respect to CSC and how it deals with Indigenous offenders. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's a really a wonderful privilege to be gathered here in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, thank you for last night. That was super refreshing. I hope everybody has a very good equinox moving on. I would like to say just a few comments. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, systemic discrimination is persisting despite volumes of recommendations emerging from royal commissions and national inquiries. And while there's been a movement to address and remedy the effects of colonialism through bail and sentencing reform, restorative justice, and culturally appropriate initiatives, Indigenous communities, social scientists, legal professionals all agree that the Canadian justice system is not working for Indigenous peoples. Indigenous communities call for the reinvigoration of their traditional legal principles and practices as the best way to address uh, the problem of overrepresentation, systemic discrimination, and racism, to decolonize the justice system, and to legitimize Indigenous legal institutions. And what those practices are, and what are their best applications today, and what resources are needed are, are, are uh, to sustain them and to make them eff efficacy, the, to improve their efficacy are key areas in inquiry. I just want to remind you of what was said in response to the Royal Commission on the Donald Marshall prosecution by the Union of Nova Scotia Indians and by the collectivity of the Mi'kmaq Nation in 1990. The Union took the lead and they said, you know, the inquiry has opened new doors. It has created new opportunities. It has fostered new hopes in our people's aspirations for self-reliance and self-determination. Now this is 1989, 1990. The union put forward a statement of principles and it offered uh, an alternative reading of the recommendations by dividing them into two groups, those that deal with improvements to the justice system outside of Mi'kmaq communities and those that pertain to the development of a justice system within the Mi'kmaq nation. And two main threads emerged in that discourse. The first was a rights discourse centered on treaty, constitutional and human rights arguments for self-determination including the right to control their own justice system. And the second thread focused on the cultural necessity to control a separate justice system in which disputes could be meaningfully managed using Mi'kmaq legal concepts. Mi'kmaq leaders submitted that it's all but inevitable that the Mi'kmaq will continue to interact with the outside system and that they were committed to working with both the federal and provincial governments to implement changes to the justice system. They welcomed all efforts to indigenize the system. An indigenized system of the present system, though, will only serve to improve the administration of a non-Mi'kmaq form of justice, law enforcement, and incarceration on the Mi'kmaq. They cautioned that this approach was not a solution for the Mi'kmaq nation, who wanted to design, operationalize Mi'kmaq justice on their own terms. And to this day, the Mi'kmaq continue to abide by a system of social control that is unique in their communities. It operates upon different principles of fairness and justice. The key question is not whether it exists, but rather how do we harness these Mi'kmaq concepts of justice to design and to develop an acceptable and effective justice system in Mi'kmaq communities. I'm not going to go on. I'll come back to some of the key points that I want to make, but I have some quotes from some uh, chiefs that I think are, are very uh, insightful to, to where the Mi'kmaq nation is on, and the desire for their self-determination in governance of uh, their corrections programs. Pam? So I don't have any papers, and nor will you see that. I, I do tell uh, a story. Um, that's traditionally how we do things. And we have the Ivans of this world to do the work, to find those numbers and all those great things. We have great uh, people that we truly partner with um, to make a difference in how we move forward. I first want to start by saying that our communities actually have the answers. We have them. The problem is, is quite often we're seen as not being legit, 
Uh, we don't ha I, I don't have a master's, I don't have a PhD, and nor do I wish to. What I do have is true experience from my community. And I know it, and I know it well. The reality is, is that I'm alive today, I'm here today because of the movement, the Friendship Centre movement. I was picked up, dust off many times, by the way. I was blessed to find some of the great elders that have since passed on, the Diamond Nicholases of this world, the Emmett Peters, who left great impacts on our communities. The reality is, we are the experts in ourselves. There is nobody else out there that's an expert in us. There is nothing any worse than I have when I, I'm sitting and I listen, and somebody say, well, I'm an expert in our communities. Well, the reality is, the only ones who are experts in our communities are us. There's a real opportunity here um, for me to tell you that at the end of the day, the Paula Marshalls of this world, myself and many other community members, we don't get to go home and walk away from our communities. Lots of people do. And most of you probably can walk out of here and never have to deal with one of our community members ever again. The reality is I don't get that luxury. Sometimes I do wish I could just walk away. Because when you hear the heartaches and the breaks that happen within community, it has destroyed us to the core quite often. However, we have the answers to fix it. We need to be allowed to do what we need to do. Being, being self-sustainable, being able to determine for ourselves where we go in the future is key in how we heal. I want true partners. And when I say true partners, I want somebody to stand next to me. I don't want somebody standing behind me, in front of me, above me, under me. I want somebody to stand next to me and truly recognize that we do have the answers. And I have seen that happen, and wonderful things happen when people are there for the right and true reasons. I encourage each and every one of you as you go through life, if you, the reality is, with the, with the amount of people we have in institutions, you're all going to run into one of my community members anyways. Do yourself a favor. Come to our communities. Understand who we are and what we are. Build a relationship before you have to. The best thing I can tell you is come into our communities and experience who we are and what we are. Don't sit back and go, I'm going to wait till I have to. You know, the letters, you know, there's nothing any worse when I see letters that are mandating people to do things for our community. It shouldn't be a mandate, we should want to do it. We're human beings, we're good people, and yet the only time we ever seem to be in the media is when there's something negative. I gotta tell you, we've got great people in our communities who are doing wonderful things. Whether it's a friendship center or another organization like MLSN, you know? Quite often, we're doing 20, 30 different things off the side of our desks. The reality is, I may be the ED of the Friendship Center. However, I'm going to tell you, I've cleaned toilets. As a matter of fact, not long ago, I was up on our roof in heels, by the way, um, with, a tar, with tar fixing a hole in the roof. You know, that's a reality. We do what needs to be done, and I'm quite happy, and I will do it till I can no longer do it. But that goes back to you know, um, the mention of the new Friendship Center and the ability to take that to the next level. That Friendship Center is not just bricks and mortar. It is a building, make no mistake, but it's so much more. It's gonna give us the ability to become self-determinant and self-sustainable. And then I can decide for my community and my community can make recommendations as to what programs and services we need that we're not being dictated to or that I'm not trying to figure out um, a year here and a year there. Pilot projects kill us. They kill us. They set us up for failure time and time and time again. Community members come in and they all of a sudden there's this great service that's there that has been created by community for community. And then all of a sudden the funding ends. So all of a sudden, they're left with nothing. And we're trying to fill the gaps, we're trying to fill, fill those pieces. Seven Sparks was a great program that we once had. It worked with our community members who were incarcerated. We worked with them on the inside and we built them a plan on the outside. And we worked with them and they were successful and we were able to fill some of those gaps, whether it be employment and training, housing, whatever that may be. The Friendship Center has over 28 different programs. It's wraparound services. It is about making sure our community members have the supports. 
and kicking them out the door, sending them without a real plan in place? Boy, oh boy, are you ever setting them up for failure. Let's be honest, the institutions are designed to keep us in the institutions. And I know lots of people get very offended when I say that, but they're not there to actually support us to get out. And many of our kids that start in foster care, and you think we've got a problem now with residential schools? Boy, we've got more kids in care now than, than ever. And they're all going right straight through the system from beginning to end. There is no out for them. There is no off-ramp for them. But we have the answers to some of that. We have the answers. Friendship centers and other organizations, communities have the answers. We have the supports and we have the ability to do what needs to be done to support our community members. You know, the reality is we're not just dealing with one side. We're not just dealing with the offender. We're dealing with the followed on the other side too. We're dealing with, you know, spouses and family and, uh, you know, children quite often. We're trying to find that balance. And the reality is you can't treat it separately. You can't treat it separately. It's a family unit. It's, it's, that's what it is. And family is everything to our communities. So I, I, you know, I just, I know I only was supposed to just ramble for a few go, minutes, go, but... Go, 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 Pam, go! As always, I tend to uh, ramble and, and I try to tell a story in a way that I want you to remember that we have the answers and we know we can make an impact for our community. But I will tell you this, I don't want to do it alone. I can't do it alone. I've tried to do it alone and you get tired. You know, you look at poor Paula, and, I, and I, I know she's not here, and quite often she is pulled in 10 different, different directions, and that program works, MLSN works, and it doesn't even have core funding. Paula doesn't know from one day to the next whether or not she's going to have her job. Like, let's be honest here. How do, you actually how do you move forward and actually offer a program and service that is sustainable and reliable when you don't even know if you're going to get a paycheck. You know, whose responsibility is that? The, the problem is, is that nobody wants to step up to the plate. Nobody wants to do something a little different. And sometimes I, and, and I, I question, I sometimes wonder, does anybody really want our communities to move forward? There's jobs attached to us. There's money attached to us. And those are tough conversations. Those are really tough conversations. I often think, you know, tomorrow if the Friendship Center didn't exist where our community members would be. We have over 5,000 people that come through our door on a yearly basis. What happens to them? Where do they go? I know, you know, the fact that, you know, Paula's had four suicides in the last week, two, um, it affects me deeply because they're our community members. They are our community members. And they are real people and they deserve so much more. And I know it personally. My nephew committed suicide three years ago. So I know the impacts those have on us as human beings. And again, most people get to go home at the end of the day. I don't. My phone rings all hours of the night. I take emails whenever I, I, I can, evenings, weekends, whatever it may be. You know, the reality is my community in the urban context is real, it's tangible, and our communities are real and tangible. And if somebody would just sit back and listen to our elders, to our communities, we can do something magnificent and we can change the output and the input that goes in through our communities, because quite often we're seen as dollar signs. Let's be honest, you know, there's pro I, probably not one person here that hasn't said, uh, oh, you know, I, that silly little status card that I have. You know, people, oh, that's great, you don't pay taxes, you don't do this, you don't do that. Oh my gosh, I wish somebody would tell Revenue Canada I don't pay taxes. <laughs> you know, like, come on. Like, we are so back sometimes, we're so stuck way back there. That little card has been no favor for me, let me tell you. It's probably caused me more headaches than, than anything. And yet I've been determined by somebody else that this card is my number. And when I go and I go to for services or whatever I may need, well, what's your number? How about what's my name? You know, 
our people that are institutionalized, they're good people. They've, many of them have gone through trauma that most people don't even understand or recognize or care to understand or recognize. We know that knowing who you are and where you come from is often a very big piece of what's missing. I have, I, I'm very fortunate, I have two beautiful boys who are married and I have grandkids. And I'm going to tell you, my boys, I, I didn't, I, they did not have it easy growing up. I was on them like you would not believe. I was terrified of some of the things happening to them that happened to me. And I made conscious decisions with them. And the reality is our young men are lost. They don't have a role anymore. They don't know where they fit. And we need to be looking at that. We need to be dealing with our young men and women together, not separately, not doing a program here for this and a program there for that. It needs to be incorporated together. We need to understand who we are and where we come from and what our roles are. There's nothing wrong with knowing who you are. Because boy, oh boy, once you know who you are, you don't know where you'll end up. I know I'm very, very thankful to be here today. I'm thankful that, you know, the reality was I wasn't sure I was going to be here. And I hesitated about coming. And, and I know you didn't sleep, and I know I didn't sleep, and that's a reality. There are things that, there's moments in time that you can go, okay, I can just not do this, and I don't want to do it. But the reality is, this is a gift, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to run with it. The gift is, is that I get to speak to you guys, and if I can change one person today, it's a gift worth having. There are challenges in life that I, I wish I could change that I've done, some of the choices I've made in my life. However, I'm not sure I would actually do it if, if the great creator came to me and said, Pam, we're going to change some of the stuff that you've done in, in, in life. Not sure I would do it now. Maybe if you had asked me as my kids were small, maybe I would have. But the reality is, is those decisions I've done, those experiences that, that I've gone through, I now have a voice that I can truly say I know what I'm talking about. I can tell you that whether it's UNDRIP, you know, the Royal Commission, the TRC, you know what, I, the reports that I'm sure in eventually 20 years from now, I'm sure TRC is going to be sitting on a shelf somewhere. I, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell you time and time and time and time again, there's, listen, we've been studied to death and I've, and I've been interviewed a thousand times and I'm going to tell you, um, and I, and I always laugh because we do do a lot of research and I always say, you know, it's community owned. That's the only way I'm involved in research. But the reality is, as a kid, you know, you know, we were always doing research and we were always given that 20, I think it was 25 bucks back then gift card. But I'm going to tell you, I lied through my teeth so much on those things. Like, and it wasn't just me. That was the best of it, right? Like, we lied. We just wanted that $25 gift card or whatever it was they were giving us. You know, you get tired of, of having those conversations and you think you're doing good for our community, but unless the community is the driving force behind it, don't do it. Don't do it. Make sure that the community is the driving force. You make sure that community understands what you're doing. I'm going to tell you, most community members want you as partners. I want you coming to my center and I want you to come in and understand who we are and where we come from, what we have to offer. But don't, we, quite often when we get people who show up and, and, and they have a little letter from judge or somebody that says, oh, I have to be here. Pardon? Where was the, where, where were we in that decision making? So, you know, when, when those things happen, you kind of step back and, and you go and, and, um, you look at it and you think, okay, so they know the Friendship Center exists, but do they really know what we do as community members? Do they know what's really out there? And I don't. I don't think people really know what's out there in community. And the problem is, is quite often, it's not with a PhD, it's not with a master's, it's not with all that good colonized way of doing things. And trust me, 
that will help us move forward in ways, but there's so much more to knowledge. It's not just that kind of institutionalized knowledge that you need to make a difference in community. So I'm going to leave it at that because I can talk I, all no, day. I have a question for you. Yes. So <coughs> what is your vision of a, a real partnership? If you could say right now, what is your vision? What do you need? Tell us what you would need. What would work for you right now? We're talking about corrections. But even if I ask uh, you know, Ivan and I say, well, OK, from his perspective, he's looking at it in a completely different way. And he's saying, well, this is what I think should be done. Mandate letter is useless, right? So in the end, what, just tell us what you need. What would work for you? What would be a real partnership? I mean, uh, if I can intervene, I think it's OK with you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's, that's exactly what, um, in my experience, happens to Indigenous communities and other communities. When you go and say, tell us what you need. Um, when, in my experience, when they take the time to tell us, you, me, um, it doesn't always happen. And so I would say we should be saying what we can provide. And in this context, when it comes to corrections, you may hear from um, from Ivan, he's done a lot of great work in this area, that one of the things that can be provided, there are provisions in the Act, sections 80, 81, and 84 of the federal legislation, that say Indigenous communities can, and in fact the legislative intent was to have Indigenous people in their communities and have resources to go with it. Corrections has limited those okay. provisions yes. by having very narrow policies. As you know, Paul is working on some of those, others are. And instead of saying to the community, how would you, what would you want for this to work? And when that's happened, it's worked very well. It's very rare. Mostly those are being attached to other contracts now, other halfway house contracts and that sort of thing. And those are all well-intentioned. But I, to my experience, from you know, the work I've done with Indigenous communities is you're not being asked, how do you want to use these resources? What resources do you need in the first place? And how can we assist that process? It strikes me that's the first thing we need to be doing. And the legislation allows that. The policy doesn't, but that's part of the reason, and I, I had offered to Alina because we didn't get a chance to talk in the last session, um, some research that's been done um, around what the legislative intent of those provisions was, and the fact that it was partly designed to reduce the number of people in prison in 1992 when the legislation came in. So it strikes me that we should be talking about how do we assist in getting those forward. And if you're interested, and if others are interested, um, there is some material that's been developed about that legislative intent and how to go about putting in letters to the minister to request individuals from your community to come to your community and start building the case for uh, those resources. And we're working on some legal FACTA, which, you know, all the gobbledygook, but basically to take those to court when the minister says no, because we anticipate the minister will say no. And I just saw a very interesting quote from Moana Jackson, and um, and many of us know from um, from Aotearoa, from New Zealand, who said we need to start Maoriizing the community, <laughs> not talking about decolonizing. And I would say in this case, uh, we need to start doing that as well. So. Um, I just want to thank you very much for uh, for your contribution. It was very, uh, very helpful and um, offer uh, on behalf of, there's a number of us, but myself, if I can assist with that process, um, there are resources available and I think we should be, um, I, I agree they should be being made available and being built what is needed. So I, I think there's, there's probably several, several things. One is we're one of 125 friendship centers across Canada, so you have access to an urban context, period. Some friendship centers are just starting. Some of them have, you know, we've been here for 46 years. Other friendship centers are around for 60 years. One way or another, we're all dealing with, with justice issues. So you, you have a network to be able to consult with, hands down, to get and really get the, the, the piece for urban. The other piece is when you're talking on reserve, you have to go to communities. Please, please don't ignore communities. Please engage them in a good way. Have somebody from community do that work for you. Don't, you know, the reality is there's good community members that can do that work. Secondly, I know for us, that's been a huge sticking point for us around the urban context, and part of that new Friendship Center is about having that healing lodge. The reality is we should not have to send our community members away. 
every community should be a community member should have a choice of where to stay. And sending them away, you're just re-traumatizing everybody. You're re-traumatizing the family. You're re-traumatizing the individual. It's like, you know, when, it, when, you're, when you're taking our kids, when, when the system takes our kids, you know, you're, you're re-traumatizing them for whatever may have happened. You know, I'm a firm believer, and, and listen, my brother has adopted two boys that have been in the system, and so thankful for that. But I also know that, know that there's a need for, for women who are incarcerated, too. The, the, the um, opportunities around needle exchange and methadone opportunities, like, those things are never really looked upon. They're, they're not, I'm going to say, they're not sexy, right? Probably the worst thing to say in a room full of lawyers, but they're not. People don't want to have those conversations. Having a healing lodge in your backyard, people don't like that. They're criminals. They're this, they're that. You know, we, we're working with the chiefs right now, and I'm, I am very fortunate because I do have, I uh, consider myself very lucky, I have a good working relationship with the chiefs, and actually one of the old CSC um, halfway houses that um, they're looking to get rid of, the chiefs have approached me to see if it's something we would like to take on, and, and it certainly is because it's a real need within our community to provide housing for, for people looking to get out of um, institutions, and that's really being able to provide those wraparound services that support those people. Healing lodges are huge. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be done within CSC, <laughs> which I've heard that seems to be the path. I, I, I don't know enough about it. What it needs to be is in community. It needs to be where the community is, where they can get the supports that truly are required. And that's where you will thrive. That's where you will see huge changes in community members. Um, you know, the reality is, and, and, and I hate saying the reality, but it is my reality I live every day. I don't know when my phone rings what's on the other end. Nobody does. However, on my phone, it seems to be the worst of the worst calls. We're quite often the last call that somebody can make. And being able to bring seven sparks back would be probably the biggest impact that you could have. Seven Sparks was successful. And it was so Seven Sparks, we were very fortunate. I think it was actually a five year funding pot that we had received. It's been quite a while now. My memory is not as good as it used to be. Um, and from corrections. It was from corrections. Um, and we had a lot of people pushing for that at the time um, because five years was unheard of apparently. Um, however, the Seven Sparks program actually worked with offenders while they were inside, when they came out, and of course we were fortunate because we have all these other wraparound services. So we had access to housing, child care, uh, daycare services, employment and training. So all of the other services, addiction services was there as well, uh, worked with the Seven Sparks. And we were so fortunate. We had Emmett Peters at the time, who was a wonderful, wonderful elder. He um, unfortunately has passed. And he, he literally followed these guys around, made sure they get to appointments. And the reality is there's one in particular person, and I, and I will not say his name, um, because I didn't ask if I could do that who actually was so successful with Seven Sparks. We were able, we kept him, he, we had, a, his employer loved him, we found an employer to take him on, and he was so successful. Seven Sparks stopped existing. And then all of a sudden those supports, we, we do the best we can, we still do Section 84s and, and that off the sides of our desks. But the reality is, is when that stopped, those supports were no longer there. And I do believe that they had been there. He would never have gone back inside. He's now out again. But again, he had to go away to get the help he needed. Because we didn't have those resources here anymore. And the reality is we know our communities and we know them really well. We know where they're going to go. We know who they're hanging with. We know all of that. So I think if you were to ask me what you could do for me, support organizations like Friendship Centers, like MLSN, make sure that, make sure MLSN is core funding, seriously. Like, I, I, I just, 
my mind just gets so ball and I happen to sit on the board of MLSN so I know the challenges that they have seen you know when you when you have community members working side by side with other non-indigenous community members doing the exact same job and them getting paid you know twenty thirty thousand dollars more than what you're doing because you're from an indigenous organization it's wrong really really wrong there's something wrong with that and make sure they're funded well make sure MLSN has a voice and make sure that they have some sustainability those pilot projects kill us like honestly I every time I see a call for proposals and there's a pilot project opportunity I am always so hesitant now to actually do a pilot project because they do hurt us they actually hurt us I'm sure the intent was never meant to do that I, I like to think that <laughs> um, because I think that's what keeps me sane. But the, rea the piece is, is that when we do pilot projects, it sets us up for failures. We, we, we set people up, we get them here, and then all of a sudden they're back down here. It's the same seven sparks, right? We had five great years. We did great things. The evaluation was phenomenal for it. And it was towed it right across Canada. We did presentations on it right across Canada. And yet government changed and it was no longer a real priority. So whether, and uh, listen, I'm, I'm very fortunate in what I do because I do get to build relationships in Ottawa and I do get to build uh, relationships with all levels of government. And that's a lot of work. It's really not my job because I really should be doing, <laughs> doing my day-to-day -day work and I'm fortunate that I have great staff. But I also recognize that I need to be able to be building those relationships, finding the warm, fuzzy people out there that really want to make a difference for my community. The Jane McMillans of this world, the Ivans of this world, we all play a major role in what we do. But I need everybody to be a partner with me and a true partner. And that means working with us, listening to us, recognizing us for what we have to say. Listen to us. Listen. I'm telling you, the answers are there. And, and you won't look far for them, because they are there. So if I can ask um, Ivan, um, what are the chances are, what are the chances of CSC being able to actually engage in true partnerships, given its history? <laughs> 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 no pressure, right? Yeah. You know what, when I, um, uh, when I became um, a civil servant uh, more than 20 years ago, I had the, uh, uh, the real delight to uh, uh, meet and work for a couple of years with the late Maxwell Yaldon. Uh, he was the former chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And a couple of years before he retired uh, in that role, um, he had publicly said that the number one um, issue dealing with human rights in Canadian society is the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in prisons and jails, um, as well as how we treat Indigenous uh, people. Let's move, you know, forward into the future, uh, a little about 20, 25 years later. Um, the rate in terms of overrepresentation has doubled. He described at that time uh, as being a crisis. So I don't know what happens when you double, you know, and you're up to 28% of Indigenous people now are uh, in federal corrections. How do you classify that? And we actually also reach a new um, milestone for women. We're up to 40%. Can you imagine 40% of all uh, incarcerated women are uh, indigenous background? So, uh, you know, I, I know one thing is that in, in terms of the, uh, in social science, uh, when you, uh, typically, you never ever get a trend that year after year so systematically gets worse. It, it doesn't happen. Usually things move up and down and so on. And this is one where we have a perfect linear relationship. For the last 30 years, as far as we can go back in terms of uh, counting uh, the overrepresentation, things have gotten worse. No government has actually been able to slow down, stop it, or even better, reverse it. 
Um, so when I hear that there is, you know, a, a, now we, we are, uh, you know, just to give you a, a sort of a different take on it, um, if we were magically able to match the incarceration rate of indigenous people in this country to their proportion proportionality in the community, we would have an incarceration rate like, you know, Finland, Sweden, um, and we would be at the top of the world in terms of, of uh, uh, our ability to, um, uh, you know, to, you know, to basically have citizens that are, you know, I, I, you know, I guess the, the use of, of uh, imprisonment at, at uh, one of the best rates in the world. So we're not there. Um, I am skeptical about any time that I hear about um, investment, uh, basically, in the criminal justice system. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, let's focus on CSC, which is at the tail end of the criminal justice system, to try to fix a problem that is way more upstream. Um, and Gladue is the same thing. Um, Gladue, for me, is a Band-Aid. It's arm reduction. Uh, it doesn't go to the cause root, root of... Uh, so do we want to do more Gladue? Do we want to spend a bit more money? Do we want to do, you know, give CSC more uh, awareness training or, or competency training? Or, uh, so I think we have to do something bold. I think it is time to do something bold. Um, like what? Uh, because upstream, the issues, in my views, uh, that, that flows are, are human rights issues and it's the inability of the Canadian society to have made a, a, a society where, uh, where indigenous people can benefit from socioeconomic rights, equal opportunities, equality, um, you know, political rights, indigenous rights. Um, so uh, is this applied to me? So I, I'm just... <laughs> Okay, it's okay for everybody. Uh, so we, you know, these are, are, are the things that, that needs to be addressed. So, uh, so when I hear you and you're, you know, and, and, and you're skeptical about, uh, about the future, well, with that trend, I would be skeptical too, uh, unless something bold happens. Um, Kim is absolutely right. In my role as uh, in, um, correctional investigator, uh, I'm mandated to, you know, I'm part three of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, and I have to look at the act for compliance and for fairness. And I think absolutely there are uh, wiggle room in the existing law. Um, and basically, I would argue that Section 81, Section 84, and uh, the focus on community corrections have not been implemented as it was uh, intended by the legislature uh, back in 1992. So that's more than 25 years ago. So we could do a huge uh, shift in resources, existing resource, I'm not talking about spending more money, um, because we're spending about $115,000 per inmate uh, uh, per year, and it's uh, over 200 for women. Uh, and we could reinvest this in community alternatives. Uh, and community alternatives means to partner with the community. Uh, and, and, Can I ask you a question? And, and I would see a big budget of CSC uh, being uh, uh, just like a program department where they hand over a Can significant... Can I have that in writing? Yeah. <laughs> You have to remember, I'm an ombudsman. I no binding. Uh, uh, but these are the kinds of bold things within corrections. I, I, I don't know what we need to do in society, but within correction, there are things we can do. But I have um, a very specific question. That is, there's talk of AUCs, five regional centers, being set up, and they'll be running by the end of the year. And I'm not sure what they sound like, but they sound like Aboriginal. So, do you know anything about this? Because they've well, they're, been they're in operation already. They're in well, operation. They? Uh, so it's basically, and I told the senior deputy commissioner uh, as well as the commissioner on this. Uh, in order to respond to the Auditor General of Canada uh, criticism about uh, uh, failing to provide Indigenous people with uh, programming on time and, and making them ready for their first eligible parole. They created these centers at, at, uh, during the, inside the intake admission uh, units uh, to try to fast track. 
And the only thing that I said to, to, to the senior deputy commissioner and the commissioner is, well, finally, you're applying the law. You're applying the law specifically to the indigenous because you're actually doing good case management and getting people quicker through the, the hoops. Uh, when they get there, they get right away enlisted in program, they fast track their program. Once they got the program, right away there's a review to see whether we can cascade them to a lower level security. So, and it's actually working. So in the past year, they have been able to uh, make a, a bit of movement. Uh, but the whole initiative for me is simply doing what their law requires them to do for all offenders. Um, but of course, if they do it for all offenders, then the gap between a, you know, an, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous will not, uh, you know, uh, everybody will benefit and there will still be the same gap. So they're, they're being strategic on how they're, they're prioritizing these things. Um, they're not envisioning reaching out horizontally to communities at well, greater intake. Well, for me, it's, it, the, the shift has to be way more than doing what you're supposed to do under the law and, and, and uh, uh, you know, making sure you don't have wait lists and making sure people enter into program and that the programs are actually uh, meaningful and, 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 and responsive to the unique needs. Uh, but I have talking too much. Maybe I should uh, give you... Uh, no, we just like to, to see the road. Tangled okay. Around your yeah, yeah, well, it's... It, it's uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, I'll tell you, I, they're putting a lot of efforts. The issue and a lot of money, and the issue for me is whether looking from the outside, inside, uh, whether um, they're, uh, they're getting the best value for their efforts and money. And my answer to that is no, because if you look at uh, uh, correctional outcomes on indigenous, they are more likely to be released later in their sentence, they're more likely to be segregated, uh, you know, subject to use of force, they're more likely to self-harm, et cetera, you know, uh, do you, do you uh, suicide attempts. Do you consult with people so. in the government? Is there any sense of, like, are they receptive to some of the things that you're proposing? Well, the, the mandate letter is truly exceptional in terms of, uh, I think it's the first time in Canadian history that a mandate letter to a deputy has uh, uh, been uh, uh, publicly released. Uh, and I'll tell you that on, on two counts. The, the first count is that um, historically, the mandate letters are part of a deputy head compensation. So deputy heads, deputy minister, received a base salary, and uh, then they receive a mandate letter, and if they accomplish certain objectives that uh, assist the government, they get a performance bonus. Uh, and the bigger the performance bonus, uh, it means that they have achieved a lot of uh, 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 tick marks on those mandate letters. So this is why it's very unusual that this letter is actually um, uh, published. Um, and the second point is that you have to ask yourself, why did they publish this? Well, I think after almost three years into their mandate, and maybe Kim, you can correct me, um, uh, I think the shift between what happened under the Harper government and 10 years of very entrenched law and order uh, uh, approach, uh, CSC has been, uh, has been having difficulty to get uh, clarity on, on their marching order and, and the directions that this government wanted to go to. So by publishing uh, that letter, it makes it clear to the rank and files and all employees of the Correctional Service of Canada, here's what we expect of you. Um, so this is a very, very unusual uh, uh, so set of circumstances. So then we flip back to Kim's idea, which is, is the time for community action now? Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to, one other thing you asked, what else? Um, just having been up north with a number of Indigenous communities, um, a concept that not, most of them had no idea about was guaranteed livable income. Yeah. And uh, Art Eggleton has just released a book. Evelyn Forget is about to release one. Um, there's Move Afoot to look at a federal initiative and to free up social workers to no longer police people in the way that in comparable below parole officers police uh, individuals on, on conditional release and to allow communities to actually have people with resources to be able to go out on the land, to learn from the elders, to contribute in ways, instead of being trying to pretending like they're looking for non-existent jobs every day, and to actually move through into a different place. And, 
And there's a very strong case for investing in those resources mm -hmm. um, up front that the Auditor General has made as well. And so I think all of us here, you may think, what does that have to do with prisons? It has a lot well, to do with prisons. It's upstream. Set. And so it really is about um, starting to look at how we can be pushing and, and doing the intersecting work that needs to happen. Because if you're working in prisons, you're working with poverty. You're working with racism. You're working with all forms of discrimination and seeing the end result of every system that fails. Uh, because the abandonment is the prison system is the only one that can't refuse people. So I think it is something we should be looking at. So should we ask a kind of naive question perhaps? Those are the most dangerous. Well, <laughs> our existing resources and Pam, you've got some really great ideas, right? Within the framework, what do the resources need to actually be for them to be effective? So who needs to I mean, who needs to be told to get over here and sit down with Pam and start being her partner how to actually make this happen? Because she sounds like she's never been talked to, really. Well I'm asking Ivan and Pam, like who needs to be sitting down in that room to actually bring together the commitment that you're that you're, you're demonstrating to, to realize what Pam and the community knows needs to happen? Well, you know, I, I, I'm a bureaucrat, so I will, you know, initially, and I will tell you that now we do have this mandate letter. So now it's clear that the government has made it cl uh, crystal clear that. Uh, we need to move in that direction. Uh, and that, uh, that mandate letter uh, uh, reflects uh, certainly a lot of things that uh, are in my annual report and my upcoming annual report, um, and uh, reflects also the, uh, the call for action. Um, so now I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, you can wait for the commissioner to give you a call, but now you can also uh, you know, I you can con wait. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can contact the commissioner and say, "Okay, now uh, you've got clear uh, directions from the government. Um, how can I help you? What can I do uh, to make this work?" And uh, let let's start discussing. And if it doesn't work, then you uh, obviously uh, you go step above, and then you say, "Minister, you j you wrote to your uh, deputy head." Uh, saying that these are the uh, expectations, this is directions, and I'm not getting any traction. So I think this is why that mandate letter is important um, uh, in a bureaucracy. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, like any other government department. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think that that's the. So this is why there is a bit of hope here. Um, but again, I, I, I'm, I'm cautious about this hope because uh, I showed you the the data seems to be uh, going the wrong direction um, and I think something bold got to happen you know obviously in corrections there are things that we can do but corrections is is you know uh, is at the end of the line and uh, uh, that's not you know for me we have to talk about you know all sorts of things upstream to uh, uh, so that it doesn't become just a, a, a band-aid um, solution um, There's a, an, an announcement last week of a new jail opening up in Cape Breton, but there's been no inclusion of consultation with the Mi'kmaq Nation on, on what that looks like as of yet. And so these are, the mandate letter hasn't filtered through clearly in the actions of people. And the burden shouldn't be put on the Mi'kmaq community at all. And I worry about uh, Section 81, 84s and the imposition of the, the way the contracts work for, for community and the criteria in which they, they get negotiated or not. And if it becomes tough to have that conversation or that tough conversation, they're abandoned. And it's the inmates that suffer as a consequence of that. So there is an awful lot of correction that has to be done on the engagement with community, absolutely. Pam, do you want to? Yeah, I, and, and that's a good point. Th there is a lot of corrections that need to happen. But I will challenge each and every one of you, and, and I know this, just close your eyes and take a leap of faith with community. Just close your eyes and take a leap of faith. 
I know it works and I know community has it, the ability to, to rise to the occasion. What have you got to lose? I know we have nothing to lose at this point. You know, we continue to see the numbers go up. You need to try something different, unique, and something that, yeah, you're right, it may not even fit within a guideline that you may have right now. But it, take a leap of faith, do something different. That's the only way it's going to change. And you need to, you, you know, I've had conversations with people, we've had the same conversation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. People are having the same conversations, the numbers keep getting worse. The only way to change it is to change what we're doing. You know, we're doing the same things over and over. We're putting different little tags on it, little, you know, I, I always laugh, you know, government changes and all of a sudden that no longer exists. So we're going to reinvent that program and we're going to change the name. And, but it's really the same program. So the reality is you need to really take a hard look and say, okay, we're going to stop it here and we're going to create something new that we know works. And we do know what's working in community. <coughs> We really do. So, take a leap of faith with us. Ivan, I've always been intrigued why your office doesn't hold investigative hearings, why, to my knowledge, you've never been an intervener in a court action, and why you don't, your staff does not file with the Correctional Service or the Board, i.e. the Parole Board of Canada, of finding the fact. I realize you, you're an ombudsman and you can't direct the service to do things, but you can make findings of fact. You can be a lot more aggressive about the situation than historically your office has been. And I go way back to when the football guy was the chair of your agency and he was stealing from the people of Canada and the convicts he was supposed to serve? Um. Well, thank you for the, 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 the question. The question was asked yesterday, and I didn't answer it very well, so this is great that I have another uh, kick at the can. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I guess uh, I have to tell you that there is a provision, the, the Act, which is in, in provision of any uh, Ombudsman Act, uh, that uh, the, uh, the person who holds the office uh, does, uh, is not competent before any legal uh, it is not uh, uh, compelable nor competent before any legal proceedings. So that's why I'm not anywhere to be found. And every time that somebody is trying to get me to come and testify, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not competent, which I, I love to say, I'm incompetent. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so it's, a, it's part of the scheme to protect the confidentiality uh, and 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 the, the the fact that one of the pillars of successful ombudsmanship is to maintain confidentiality and to resolve the matters informally. Uh, so uh, the hearings um, for me makes it more in the realm of uh, of lawyers and the formal system. And I I am and will remain an alternative uh, to that formal system that uh, isn't, uh, as I say, we were created because that formal system uh, has too many barriers in terms of when you've got lawyers and time and money and so on. Um, if you want a hearing, uh, I, mean, I say I will always consider it, uh, but it, it's got to, I, I don't quite see how because it, 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 uh, it, it would happen because it is so, um, uh, I would say, uh, so formal uh, it requires lawyers, and, and it, it goes a bit against the values of an ombudsman trying to resolve matters informally when everybody is lawyered up. That can happen through the Inquiries Act if you want an inquiry. My time is up. So. Uh, <laughs> it's time out. Yeah. Thank you. She's been time holding out. that time out. <laughs> so, anyway, happy to. Uh, yeah. Thank Perfect. you, everybody. Thank you. And my apologies. <clears throat>